Sure, please. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. We're a little alarmed by how many of you. <laughs> That's great to see everybody. Thank you. Um, if we could say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, now we're going to do roll call. Uh, Tori is absent. Jean? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Patrick? Yes. Yeah. Scott is absent. Grace? Yes. Okay. If I could get a motion to approve the agenda as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Communication. Uh, recognition of staff, student, and community volunteers. If, I believe Berkeley is going to first with Mr. Kern and Ms. Gardner. Thank you for doing these recognitions of our students. Uh, they're really important for us and our students just to show some of the uh, great kids that we have in the building. And today we are going to uh, tell you a little bit about Logan Brotherton, who is both our NEA and our building unanim unanimously through all of our staff as our person to be recognized tonight at the board meeting. I'm Meredith Halford and I am the ELA interventionist over at Berkeley Middle School. And I have had the wonderful pleasure of working with Logan uh, all of last year during his sixth grade year and now moving on to his seventh grade year. And I just have to say that Logan is very kind, caring, and hardworking, and he truly does exemplify the Berkeley High Five with being responsible, being prepared, being cooperative, being respectful, and all the other things that we strive for at Berkeley. And truly everybody that he comes into contact with at school, whether he knows them or not, student or staff, he wishes them a good morning, a good afternoon, just all the wonderful, excellent pleasantries. And that's why we decided to vote for him as our Berkeley student. Congratulations. Okay, next is Border, Dr. Moss. Student coming in too, and she was, I sent Ms. Boren out to try to find her because she was having trouble finding how to come in. So she might be joining us. Um, but yes, as I am Dr. Moss, principal at Forder, and I'm so excited to share and celebrate and recognize our interventionist at Forder. And this evening, I have invited Mrs. Schwab, our SEL interventionist, um, and then Mrs. Bright, our school counselor, to tell you a little bit about all the great things we're doing with social emotional learning. Hello, my name is Mrs. Schwab, Sarah Schwab, like Dr. Moss said. I'm the social emotional learning interventionist at Forder Elementary. I've been in that role since January 2021, and I'm gonna take a couple minutes to highlight the important work I do at Forder. I work with all students, kindergarten through fifth grade, to support their social emotional needs. I do this by collaborating with all of our staff, including our school counselor, Ms. Bright. Together, we make sure every classroom gets a weekly SEL lesson. I teach six of those whole group lessons a week, and we work together and use data from panorama, needs assessments, and teachers to perform interventions for our students. 
One of the most common interventions we use is conducting small groups. Uh, these groups focus on friendship, self-esteem, self-regulation, social skills, conflict resolution. And these groups typically last about eight, eight weeks where we monitor student data based on surveys. Another intervention used a lot in our building is check-in, check-out. Last year we had 15 students that were in that intervention. I was a mentor to six of those. So they get paired with a mentor in our school and they have a daily goal that helps them um, succeed in academics and with behavior. Uh, last year, like I said, I had six of those students. Ms. Bright and I also work with students one-on-one -on, -one on topics like grief, anxiety, goal setting, self-regulation. Um, we also help a lot of our younger students at the beginning of the year um, learn about listening and the four or five, which is being respectful, being cooperative, being responsible, being kind, and being safe. Um, in a moment of crisis, I can also assist teachers um, and help de-escalate a situation to keep the environment safe for learning to continue. And then once that students calm down and ready to join their classroom, they're able to go back in and um, continue to learn. This job allows me to help students become more confident problem solvers that thrive in our schools. Thank you for listening. Hi, good, good evening, my name is Cindy Bright and this is my 16th year as the counselor at Forder. Um, I just wanna thank you all for allowing us to have this SEL position. Having Sarah as a partner has allowed me to do so much more than I could before. Um, we are able to support our students and respond right away when they need something, whereas in the past, because there was just one of me, it would sometimes take me a while to be able to get to a student, or I would have to cancel other things in order to help someone who was in a crisis. And so then there were students who weren't getting other services because I had to to step away for that. Um, she's allowed, our collaboration has allowed us to be in every single classroom every single week, and that doesn't happen in all the buildings. And we also are able to provide those small groups and the individual supports that she mentioned. And I don't know, this having Sarah be part of the team has been a whole new world for me as a school counselor. And so I just really want to thank you all for your support of having interventionists in our building because it makes a huge difference. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stacy Bourne and I've been working as a fifth grade teacher at Forder for 18 years. Um, as you are all aware, we have a very high need population at Forder and their needs range both academically and emotionally. These last few years have definitely been different compared to all the years I've taught prior. Those differences are actually positive ones. With the addition of the interventionist at Forder, our team has uh, made teaching more efficient, more individualized, and more differ differentiated. Currently, I work with three interventionists in my classroom. Ms. Gedeke, our reading interventionist, Mrs. Williams, our math interventionist, and Mrs. Schwab, our SEL, and our behavior interventionist. Uh, the reading and math interventionist push in my classroom for 20 minutes a day. While 20 minutes doesn't seem like a lot of time, it does make a difference in our day and my teaching. Because there are, are in there, they're able to hyper-focus on strategies, um, common mistakes kids are making on their classwork, and provide another instructor, instructor to work with students either with remediation or enrichment. Both interventionists see small groups in my class while I work with a small group as well. They, they may see a group of um, five or six students for four to six weeks before we reevaluate and switch groups around. In reading, I currently have students reading at a level E, which is a kindergarten level, all the way up to a level T with a fifth, at a fifth grade level. Because of that, having Ms. Gedeke see one of my reading and strategy groups allows me to focus on other students either individually or in small groups. If there were no, um, especially individually, if there are not, no other students at that same reading level. Mrs. Williams works similarly with me, seeing a small group of students to work on math skills. With her help, I'm able to work with my 22 students in five groups instead of four. Smaller groups provide a more indiv individualized instruction. Mrs. Schwab, our SEL interventionist, has also been an amazing addition to our staff. She provides weekly SEL lessons to my students that are hands-on, interactive, and engaging for all my students. 
She's created great relationships with every fifth grader, mostly because they create the most drama. Um, they love having her in our room to help work through typical fifth grade social skill problems and really breaking down the drama that they may have throughout the day. As with any fifth grade classroom, the drama usually grows right after recess. Because of this, Mrs. Schwab, because of Mrs. Schwab, students are able to go talk through issues instead of me putting aside my read aloud or reading lessons to help those students through their crisis. Students trust and respect Mrs. Schwab. When they're having problems at home or with other students in class, she's the first person they ask for. They know she will be an active listener and help bounce ideas off them. They also know her kind, caring personality will help them transfer into a calming feeling. Interventionists continue to make a difference at Forder, whether it is uh, changing one student's feeling about success at school or helping an overwhelmed teacher like myself dig through data, data to provide the best instruction for my students. Interventionists are a huge part of our success, and I'm so thankful that you've allowed them to be a part of our team. And we have a Forder student here that's gonna talk about some of the SEL student, or services that she has used at our school. So this is Chloe Dawson. As Mr. Schwab said, she goes to school at Forder. She's in fourth grade, and she was in the friendship group last year, and it made her feel, and she wrote this, um, but it, she feels more confident when we met every week to learn about friendship with Mrs. Schwab. Mrs. Schwab helped her calm down by giving her breaks, and it helped her because she could pay attention in class, and I know that Mrs. Schwab is here when I need help for kids like me. Thank you for letting us showcase Mrs. Schwab and a little bit about the interventionist at Forder. Thank you. Thank you. Does she want to do it? Okay, now I believe we have Mrs. McKelvey with the MNEA. Good evening, my name is Dina McKelvey and I am president of Melville NEA and I too agree with Mr. Kern that this is such a great opportunity for us to let our teachers tell you about some of our great students. And I know that Logan was already up here but I, and I know they already shared some things. I'm gonna share a couple other things that were shared with me about Logan, yes, please come on up. It's the first one of the year, I'm obviously very rusty. What was sent to me is, Berkeley is nominating Logan Brotherton for Student of the Month. Logan is a kind, caring, and hardworking seventh grader at Berkeley Middle School. He exemplifies the Berkeley High Five by giving well wishes to all students and staff that come into contact with them on a daily basis. We not Pardon me. We nominated him as our student of the month, not only for the reasons listed above, but because Berkeley's character word of the month for August is kindness, and September is respect. He, his kindness is contagious, and he is a fantastic Berkeley bodcat.
Okay, and then our next student of the month for M Melville and EA is from Forder, and I believe the, our, the teacher and student are both here. So if they could approach the, mo the podium. Hi, I'm Heidi Quintus. I teach fourth grade at Forder Elementary, and I'm here to introduce Emma Stuckel. Emma is a shining star. She arrives at school every day with a positive attitude and has fun while she's learning. Her enthusiasm inspires others, whether she's in class, at Girls on the Run, swimming, gymnastics, or any other activity. She spreads her kindness to everyone, especially when she notices someone may need a friend, and she's the first to lend a helping hand to students or adults. Something so special about Emma is the fact that she is always looking out for others and their feelings. Emma sees another student alone or without a partner. She is the first to make that student feel included. Emma is a true model for all, or a true role model for all of us. Thank you so much. Okay, now we move on to open period for patron comments. We do not have anyone signed up to speak. So we will move on to student achievement, uh, Berkeley Middle School. Perfect, thank you very much for allowing us to speak with you on the first board meeting that schools are speaking at. We're gonna share a little bit about uh, Berkeley Middle School, just in general and kind of what we look like uh, this year, and then get into our interventionalists and how important they are uh, at Berkeley to all of our students. Uh, overall, we're right around 200 uh, students per grade level, our eighth grade being our biggest class this year, and at 210, that's 23 more kids than what started with us when, when they were in sixth grade. Uh, so each year we're adding uh, several kids, we're obviously losing a few as well. Uh, we also added in a picture kind of, of the uh, real world experience that our classrooms are doing, just one picture of our academy when they did their crime scene unit, which had all four of our uh, core subjects uh, participating in it, and the students uh, went through this for a three-day period. Uh, for demographics, with our 595 students that we have, 
Uh, 99 of our kids are getting EL services on a daily basis with a total caseload in our building of 211. Uh, 12 of our students are new to the country that are considered immigrants, uh, so in the country less than 12 years with very li limited English experience. And there's over 17 languages that our students speak at home. Um, we're a little bit heavier on the boy side with 55% of our students being boys and only 45% of them as girls. And currently we're the highest since I've been at Berkeley with 57% of our students qualifying for free and reduced lunch or 36% of our uh, students as EL. Uh, for our students with IEPs, we have 97 uh, students, when I made this slide, that have IEPs, we have grown to 103. Uh, 64 of our students are receiving uh, direct instruction in reading through SSD, and 50 of them receiving direct instruction through math in, uh, through SSD, uh, both in co-taught um, essentials classes and our center-based classes. And our total or average minutes per IEP are at 709 minutes per student. These are our five, our Berkeley High Five that we talked about earlier when recognizing Logan. But these are what our building focuses on across all grade levels with responsibility, respectful, cooperative, prompt. Um, one of the things that we try to do at Berkeley is make sure that we are focusing on the positive this year. And one of the things that we are doing is we're offering props to our students. And so this plays on to our Berkeley High Five where we are recognizing students that are consistently being responsible by building trust and reliability, consistently being respectful by understanding others and showing empathy, being prepared for classes, being cooperative, not only helping others, elevating others and building relationships peers in their classrooms, their peers in the hallways, their peers in the cafeteria, and the staff that they meet each and every day. And then prompt making sure that they are on time. And then if they are stellar, they will get all five recognitions, and we call them Bobcats and recognize them as well and celebrate their achievement. Um, this year and last year, we've been working with our MTSS committee, and this is a team of teachers that have worked hard in creating universals so that, that way our students know, no matter what grade level they're coming in at and no matter what class they're in, that we universally support them and how we are going to do that with common language and things like that. One of the ways that we assessed that was doing walkthroughs throughout our building and looking at our needs assessments through Panorama and those conversations with our team. And then here you can see some of our Bobcats doing what they do best. Um, in our top left, our student is in her class that she chose to be a part of, and she's actually in her Spanish one class, so she'll get high school credit for. The bottom left, you can see one of our students using the choice board, so he's personalized, he's learning, he's showing what he can do and how he learned in whatever way he feels most confident in. Um, our student's in the middle doing some flex seating, our student's at the top um, becoming someone else, so that way they can have conversations with others and feeling safe in what they're doing. Um, in the middle bottom, you see Logan showing off his Berkeley wows. That's just another way that we recognize our students. And then um, in the top right, you'll see our students reflected on who they were and then work together as a community to find those connections. And then the bottom, our students working on some vertical um, working spaces, reflecting on how they can real world application their Berkeley high five. So I want to introduce our two interventionists. We have Leah Ray, who has been a math teacher in the district, and this has she's made the leap to our interventionist from last year to this year. And then um, Halford, who is now in her second year of our ELA interventionist, and they have been working together to go over what was learned last year and implement what we need. So kind of looking at the big picture, as Carla just mentioned, this is my second year in the ELA interventionist position. So last year, uh, there was more of a focus on uh, implementing that tier one and tier two classroom support with just looking at grade six. When we looked at all three grades, we saw that uh, sixth grade probably had the highest need possible. So really just honing in on that one grade. And currently this school year, we are, our main goal is to implement tier one 
two and three classroom support across grades six and seven. Um, carrying on with grade seven, those relationships built from the previous year really help with um, enhancing the students' full potential and already having that familiarity with uh, curriculum from year four. And looking ahead to the future, um, ideally we would love to implement uh, tiers one, two, and three classroom support Uh, here is our uh, tier guidelines, which we uh, collaborate with with teachers. Um, mainly, we try to strive to have every teacher be a tier one teacher, um, no matter what subject it is, whether it's ELA, math, science, etc. And uh, this is the guideline that we use to uh, support our students in small groups and with. Uh, some of our goals as the interventionists is to use baseline data to implement a variety of instructional techniques um, and providing high quality instruction time needed to move students to proficiency. So if students are showing at a below basic or a basic level, trying to move those students up to a proficiency level. And we also provide input um, to our teachers that we collaborate with on the students' academic strengths and weaknesses. We do participate in monthly professional development meetings, and we assist with screening and evaluation of students and their current and upcoming progress. And uh, mainly what we do is we maintain record and data on students, and we are constantly in communication with our teachers and our students about the, our students' growth and success. Um, if you take a look at this slide back here, we provided you an example of uh, one class where uh, they just recently took their star fall benchmark test and uh, this is one example of something that I use in order to best implement instruction in a whole class or uh, making it more fine-tuned in a small group session or potentially with one-on-one uh, -on -one instruction for a student should they need it. Hi, my name's Leah Ray, and I've been in the Melville School District for 23 years. 22 of those years was sixth grade all the way up until uh, the pandemic, and then I started in with sixth and seventh graders. So I have a lot of math experience within me, and I decided, um, I thought I wanted to change, and I thought I would try doing the interventionist position since I have so much knowledge on how the kids learn and their standards and um, things like that. Coming into this year, being a brand new person, I feel like these last couple weeks I've been playing catch up, trying to figure out what the data is and how I'm gonna best implement it. Um, we have IXL as our math um, data collection. So I have a snip of Miss Burris's first hour and I had color coded it by grade level. And so if you're looking at those numbers, the kids in the blue are around first to second grade. The yellow is third grade, purple, uh, fourth and fifth grade. So it's telling me what grade levels they're working at. So we do this in the fall, in the um, spring, well, yeah, no, winter, fall, winter, and spring. Um, so it was my job in the last couple of weeks to just try and figure out how I'm going to best help these kiddos out. Um, the IXL program is, is um, gonna be my best friend this year. It'll take the, the whole grade, it'll take the teacher information by class, and it will group um, kids that have similar needs into groups, so you can see up there, this group three, and I blacked out the kids' names, could all be working on this at the same time. So if I have a group of four or five kids that are working on those skills, I can take them and do a two-tier or three-tier intervention, depending on how many kids they are. So that is uh, my goal for the year, is to set those up and work with the children that need help. This is just kind of gave you a picture of what it looks like before we had our interventionists versus when we now that we have them, before about 46 minutes spent in math and ELA with that ELA teacher, and now that we've been able to implement our um, 
interventionists, we're seeing up to 76 minutes, almost 136 with our after school programs as well, letting our interventionists stay after and meet with those students and plan with those parents what they need in order to get the best support that they need in the classroom. And we could not have all that time had it not been for our interventionists. That for our presentation, do you guys have any questions for us? Yes. I appreciate your um, information that we were given this evening, particularly about the success of the interventionist. I'm, I got to be honest, though, I'm hungry for the data that, um, that you know, we, we like to go and use for comparison's sake. Because although this, the additional time that's being spent with these students, I'm sure, is going to have remarkable results, what we need is a baseline to find out what, where are we coming from and where are we going to. And, and I could uh, get all of that in writing for you. I could talk about it a little okay. bit if you would like. That would be, if you could just, you know, let us know what the um, current status is of the grade levels in reading and, and math and uh, you know where where they stand right now that uh, that would be wonderful and, and I guess it, just to clarify are you wanting baseline of where everybody is currently or how our interventionalists have helped with the uh, increase of student knowledge or understanding um, as related to the interventionalist yes okay <laughs> So I'll talk a little bit uh, about math here first. So in last year uh, with our math interventionalist, we had uh, a total of 37% of our uh, kids excelling at term one that increased up to 47% or 10% uh, by term four. 28% uh, of the kids that increased to 29% um, on track and our critical uh, kids uh, went from 12% in the fall down to 6% in the uh, spring. 52 uh, kids, because we're talking about sixth grade with our interventionalist, 52% of our kids advanced more than a grade level and uh, 22, uh, 22 of uh, our kids ended up, uh, only 22 of our kids ended up two grade levels or below uh, in math. And for ELA, uh, we had a 3% increase from September to May uh, of our uh, kids in the top of range and 9% in or decrease of kids in our lower, our critical range, going from 44% uh, down to 35% in reading. Did that help you at all? It did. That's okay. good news. And I, I'd like to have a you. Know, I'd like. I for sure can get you. I, you down. know, I'm a hard copy person. I got to have it in front of me to make it all sink in good. But thank you for that. And I can run through all the grade levels and then numbers for you as well with intervention. That to you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I had uh, two quick clarifications. You said the English language learners is also the highest you've seen in your tenure at Berkeley. You said not the highest, but close to. Okay. And that we've been at thirty-nine percent before. Okay. So and near. some of, so part of that is we we do want kids to be moving out. Mm -hmm. So it's not that it's not a death sentence for you. We're trying to get them up to. The level of regular English speakers and then them not need services every day. So um, our 211 just a few years ago was up around 289. Okay. And then for 709 minutes for the average IEP, what time frame is that in? It's weekly. Weekly. Okay, cool. I wanted to make sure that's what it was. Cool. Thank you. Oh, I forgot one thing. What does MTSS stand for? Multi-tiered systems of support. Thank you. I, I think I knew that, but I forgot. Right, I, you at least better than what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, and you guys have a good evening. Thank you very much. I also wanted to thank you guys for your presentation. We really appreciate it and all the great work you guys are doing at Berkeley. Okay. Next is Forder, Dr. Moss. Hey, good evening. I'm excited to share with you all the great things we have going at Forder. So just to kind of start with our work on our Forder mission, as you can see, it's currently under construction. We started the school year with really looking back with what are our core values and why do, how do they impact our why? So the wordle you see there are all words that were core values that represent the staff at Forder. So we're currently working on rewording our mission. You'll have here our school improvement goals, and tonight we're really much like Berkeley gonna focus on um, that MTSS goal number five there and how staff collaborate and implement effective practices to support our students both academically and behaviorally. Here's just a glimpse at our enrollment details so you can kind of see where we are now compared to the past five years. So our free and reduced lunch rate has come back up from that slide we had during COVID when all the meals were free. Um, and then our IEP population is up just a little bit as well. A few more kids too. And here's just another view of it from the grade level and subgroups by grade. And then as Berkeley talked about, and if you were on the board last year, I talked a little bit because we were just getting started with our MTSS work. So here you'll kind of see the different supports we have at Forder when it comes to tier one, tier two, and tier three supports for our students. We're really excited this year we added the layer universally at tier one. We are piloting the Sunday Systems Essentials program. We have at least one teacher per grade level piloting that to bring some phonic support to our students. So we really recognize that that was an area of weakness that we really could enhance for our students. So we are piloting that with the help of Amanda Zink from the curriculum department. And then we are also piloting at that tier two level the intervention kit that comes along. So if the essentials isn't just enough, um, our interventionists are able to provide some additional phonic support in that area. And then at tier three, we're consistently, constantly looking at how we can best support our students with targeted interventions as well, and building our MTSS So the interventionists that we have at Forder, and I was able to showcase Mrs. Schwab earlier, we have reading K through two. We have an ESSER funded position with reading three through five. We have a math interventionist that's three through five, and then my other ESSER interventionist is an SEL interventionist. So you might be wondering, how did we determine back a year ago where we needed these ESSER interventionists? So we took a look at iReady data, standard grades, different map data, behavioral data, and determined that our three through five readers were really needing some support. And that rigor increased, and if you have heard about Forder, that really dropped off the path, you know, we hit three through five. So we knew we needed some focus on that area. We also knew we needed some work supporting our students' behavior, and in turn, increasing their academics. So then our interventionists look at who are we gonna work with. So then our reading interventionists in both K through two and three through five support all students, and they're able to push in during the reading time so that students are seen more frequently. Our math interventionist right now is really looking at iReady benchmarks and picking the kids that are kind of right there at almost mastering that skill and targeting her lessons to help close that gap for them. And then our SEL interventionist, as she spoke about earlier, has a caseload of students as well. So here to put a little face with the name, and Mrs. Hart is here, and Mrs. Schwab, this evening. So thank you for joining us. Um, so you can kind of put a little face with the name there. Um, so your guidelines is what we use to determine the duration, the frequency of what supports our students need. We look at the percentage of students that are needing mastery, and what areas of content really need intervention level wide. So you might be thinking, let's see the impact. So here is a little glimpse at last year, our data from the fall to the spring. So that window one was our fall, and then this is from the end of the school year. Last year is the most recent. I do have this year's too, but I wanted to give you a year, a year at a glance here. So we were really excited to see that in every grade, we increased the number of students that were in the green, and we decreased the number of students that were at risk in the red. So we did that in both reading and math, and we were really excited to see those results at the end of the year last year. And this is our math data, the same situation. We need a little bit more work on that, um, but we're seeing more and more green, so we're excited about that and pulling some kids out of the red. 
then this is the fall for this year. So this is a different view. This is the beginning of the year view. So it's going to show you, for instance, if you're looking at second grade, what kids know all of the kindergarten and first grade content and are ready for second grade. Okay, so this isn't covering all the second grade standards, but show you they at least know the standards to prepare them for second grade. So 77% of our kids knew all of their kindergarten and first grade standards coming into second grade. 22% of them were in that anywhere from a year or less than a year behind, and 2% were in that over two years. So then that kind of got me thinking. So I did a little bit of a deep dive in looking at the past few years. So you'll see here on the left, the beginning of the school year, you're all beginning of the school year, dipstick um, assessments here. So beginning of the school year, before COVID, before we had that three through five intervention with reading, we had 49% of our students in that tier one green, okay? The next year was our COVID year, that assessment was taken at home. The following year, which was last year, we added the interventionist, but this is an August assessment, so it didn't really tell you the work yet, okay? But that past year, we really worked on our universals and our tier one instruction, having targeted instruction in the classroom, and we added literacy for the print as a resource for our teachers. You'll see we continue to grow then in the green. The beginning of this year, we had 76% of our students in the green, and we're down to 8% of our students who are in that at-risk tier three. From four years ago, in the tier three, we had 15%. So we're really excited over time to see of our students work. For math, here's that beginning of the year view to see how many students are ready to go for that particular grade level. And then here is that four-year analysis as well. Looking back, we did experience a little bit of a COVID dip with math. So you'll kind of see after COVID, our students had to play a little catch up with that math content. But I'm really excited to share that we're where we were at the very beginning of COVID. We did have a change in math interventionists during COVID as well. So Mrs. Williams with us for 2021 and 2022. And then this will just show you here the students that have that math <coughs> intervention, um, their beginning of the year view for three, four, and five, the past two years. And then I'm really excited to share with you the social emotional growth that we've made at Forder. So I pulled the last full year before COVID, which was 18, 19, sad to say. And we had 1,566 referrals that either were handled by a classroom teacher with a behavior note or came to the office. So 158 of those were office discipline referrals and 1,408 of those were behavior notes. So a note that the classroom teacher sent home because they handled the classroom managed problem. This past year, we, were, we almost cut this in half, you know, if not more. So we were at 661 total behavior notes or office referrals. So we're really excited to see this progress our students have made because we know it affects our achievement. When we looked at our panorama results and we asked our students in grades three through five, we were in that 80th to 99th percentile for sense of belonging and engagement with our students. And then when you ask the teachers, our teacher perception, looking at emotional regulation, which this lines up with our behavior data, it was our greatest strength and compared to the Melville School District average, we were five points, five percentage points of that average for our teachers' perceptions of our students' emotional regulation. And for grit, that was our greatest increase of our teacher perception, went up 6%. So we ask our teachers, how often is your student able to control his or her emotions when he or she needs to? 84% of our teachers were kind of favorably. And we know that some of that work contributed to what our SEL interventionist does to support our students. Those social skills groups, check in, check out, friendship groups, classroom lessons, planning different movement breaks. She goes out and practices an action at recess, assists students with working conflicts and also mentoring. And then also when you ask our students, how much support do you feel adults at your school give you? So we had 79% of our students respond either quite a bit of support or tremendous amount of support that our teachers provide to our students. So just showcasing a little bit of the additional support that they have for our students. We not only have interventionists, we also have reading specialists and special educators that are coming to the support. And our focus here at Forder this year, every year we have a different theme, and this year is be you. So we're really encouraging our students to be, be brave, be kind, be you, take that extra leap, try that math problem, don't be afraid um, to go above and beyond. We really 
believe that we are a family at Forder. If you ask anybody, that is our go-to. We are a Forder family, and you can just see some of our happy kids enjoying school, enjoying learning, everything from placing kindergarten yard signs to having paint night together. Well, I think you definitely seem to hit the right choice of your interventionist, and your data certainly seems to back that up. When you've got a choice to pick, you know, two interventionists, I think you definitely put the right two in place to do that. And this data is fantastic. Please keep giving it to us on a regular basis because it's a great way to analyze what's going on. Thank you. I shared with my staff at the staff meeting, I think that was this Tuesday, right? <laughs> All the days are, and I was so excited. I had really never looked at that beginning of the school year view and over, and I kept changing the year, and I'm like, oh my God. And I was so excited about it. So I emailed them a snippet, and then I shared it at staff meeting, and, and they were proud and excited. That's too. a great comparison, because it definitely gives you that comparison of what are the inter intervention is doing in your environment. And it's a good way. And you also have a good part to start from for this year to going into next year. So that was a good choice on data comparison. Do you keep any data um, for kids that joined you in third grade versus kindergarten? You know, do you separate those kids at all? Reading. Um, we definitely have a longitudinal dashboard. I could definitely find that, but for reading we do. We keep a dashboard, especially if they're in remedial reading or receiving some type of service. Because I have found that many times when students join us after kindergarten or other kids, their school experience, there's multiple times that they've been through quite a few schools um, and they're also behind academically as well. So that would be an interesting perspective to kind of see kids that started with us in kindergarten. Yeah. Yeah. But we haven't really looked at that recently, other yeah. than with remedial. I also <laughs> wondered if you had any crossover data to show um, which which groups cross and ha and get the same services. So free and reduced lunch and the English language learners. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? I, yes. That would we be can an interesting. definitely pull that in five. Words. It would just be interesting. I, I don't know that it would. I know we can. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes they're one of the same. Yeah. Right. So yeah. yeah, I could definitely find that. Yeah, no, this is um, really good information and data. We appreciate it. Easy to read. Lots, of, lots and lots of data, like that. I understood it before you talked. If that makes sense, yeah. and that's good because, like Jean said, it's look at it. nice to see the visual. So thank you very much. I just wanted to say kudos on the phonics. That is, that's right up my alley. Thank you. I my think teachers think so too. They're very excited. <laughs> Bravo. Good so for you. And we've really noticed that's what our students are missing. In every kind of assessment you yep. give them, phonics and vocab is where their deficit is. No, they don't I have don't want to go there, yeah. but I've been saying yeah. that for years. So, Yes, and we've been very lucky that Mrs. Hart, she never wants any kudos, but she really helped us. She helped us find literacy footprints. We, she helped us find Sunday system. And we have kind of an internal professional development, you know, where our teachers know who to go to. And we have her and Mrs. Gedeke, who have been fantastic resources. And the teachers, we, they volunteered time, you know, or they did, they got paid. They did time in the summer, though. They agreed to come to their summer days and come get training. So we even provided them on training from the company. So it's been a great experience. Well, I'm excited to watch the progress. I really am. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you. And make sure you and Mr. Kern relay to your staff. Thank you for all they do. Next is governance. We have transportation data. Dan. Good evening. I'd like to start off tonight by saying thank you to my entire department for the hard work and dedication for the excellent work that they do. Uh, department. First slide, an overview of what, how many buses we have, what the yard looks like. Uh, there's 104 buses currently in the department. There's currently 71 regular drivers. Uh, we are major short, uh, 16. And, uh, I'll get into what we've done for recruitment and what the effects are going forward. Um, the inspection rate for the buses is 97 plus for the past five years, which I have up there. However, it's more like 90% for the last 25 years. So the buses are extremely safe. Um, big thing this year was fuel costs. Uh, up there, we've used uh, almost 150,000 gallons of fuel, and that's from July 1st of last year until June 30th this year. 
The big thing you've seen on TV, uh, even beginning of school and even up the, to this week, is uh, districts being short on drivers. We are not immune to that. Um, we've done everything we can to recruit drivers, uh, banners, job fairs, you'll see the at schools, uh, we park the bus, uh, ads, counts. We just can't find the drivers to fly. So right now we're 16 drivers, bu 16 drivers short and 10 activity drivers on top of that. The six in the hiring process and we're about 81% staffed. So we're just, we're doing everything we can to keep Put this in perspective, as you know, some of the districts around St. Louis, uh, one of them very close to us, they went to a one mile walk rule. And so just to give you an idea of what this looks like in 2019, that would have affected 1,200 students. Uh, in 2020, it would have affected 1,000 students. And we didn't have to do that yet, but uh, I just want to let everybody know what that would, you know, what the numbers are to it, what would affect those amount of students. What the effects are is uh, we added two more office staff this week, this year. One retired, the other one left to go to a different district. The routes had to be consolidated. And I'm not talking just Gen Ed. I'm talking about special school districts and early childhood. So the buses are heavy, very heavy. You can tell from the previous slides we're running about the same number of students, but with less drivers. Very difficult. So at that point, um, some of the after-school activities we're not being able to do because we don't have the activity drivers for them, and um, very, very heavy. And we just, some things we just can't do. But we're doing our best to get the kids to and from school. That's it. Any questions? No, nobody. No, but thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for all you and your staff do. We know you're overworked and underpaid. Underpaid. <laughs> I was going to say that that loud. Thanks, Gene. And, um, <laughs> and um, Speak we truth. certainly appreciate everything you do to get the kids to school because I know right now being that short staffed is not easy. So. But I just want to make sure that we're not immune. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Federal programs. Federal programs data. Dr. Tretter Larkin. All right, good evening. I am here to report on Titles 1, 2, and 3 supports that the district receives from the federal government and also including ESSER funding information. All right, so Title 1 provides financial assistance to our schools with high numbers uh, or percentages of children from low income families to help ensure that all children meet the challenging state academic standards. Federal funds are currently allocated through four statutory formulas that are based primarily on census poverty estimates and the cost of education in each state. <clears throat> so the purpose of this, uh, of Title I, is for primary reading services to ensure that eligible students have the opportunity to, to reach the state academic standards. Currently, we have three Title I school-wide schools benefiting from this funding, Beerbaum, Border, and then Beasley. These funds are used to pay for salaries of 8.5 reading teachers who work directly with Title I students in those schools. We also are paying for five paraprofessionals to help support students K-5 reading and math. The next bucket item is supplemental materials. These are used for reading, math, and social emotional learning materials to meet all student needs. And then we do have a bucket of professional development, which is trainings based on those three areas, reading, math, and SEL. We do have a non-public bucket. Um, non-public students who reside in one of our Title I school attendance areas can qualify for services. Each school set aside is based on their enrollment and deprivation count. Um, Non-public schools are required each year to apply for these services through DESE. For Title II, the purpose of Title II for us is primarily used for professional development. This year, the funds are used for two different categories, 
salaries, and purchase services. The salaries are for two coaches, an instructional innovation um, and data privacy coach who works in the curriculum department to coach teachers, and then the other salaries for a K-5 instructional coach. These responsibilities include coaching and providing PD. Both, both of these salaries align with the funding source. Then, professional de or, then purchase services is going to professional development for staff, including um, training in English, math, science, innovation, and gifted education. In the non-public bucket, which you will also see in Title III and IV, um, the non-public set-aside is required for any non-public school that resides within our boundaries. Each non-public school set-aside is based on their enrollment, and then the non-public school is required each year to apply. All right, for Title III, the purpose of Title III is for ling limited English proficiency to ensure that all children have a fair and equal and significant opportunity to obtain a high quality of education. In our three buckets, we have salary and benefits, which we pay for one um, ELD teacher full-time, um, the coaching stipend for an ELD coach, and one bilingual specialist. We also have subs in this bucket for during the day trainings and then extra duty um, trainings for outside the contract time. Um, and in purchase services the, is for EL conferences and trainings to support our, our ELD population. And the materials is for supplemental materials that we distribute among the 19 buildings to meet the needs of the ELD students. And then our last federal fund is Title IV. And Title IV is intended to improve the student, student's academic achievement by providing students with ac access to a well-rounded education. Since our district receives over $30,000 of Title IV, we have percentage requirements for the three um, expenditure categories. So we have at least 20% that we have to spend in safe and healthy um, category, which we use for the SEL dashboard to help staff identify needs of students. Um, it speaks to social emotional well-being and safety needs of our district and the SEL material students need. And then at least 20% and well-rounded which we provide um, materials for fine arts, um, specifically this year for visual arts and also world languages. <laughs> and then we have a category of technology and materials that can be no more than 15%, and we are purchasing um, a subscription for an online book subscription for K-5 students. The next slide just shows total number of funds by program over the last four years. As you can see, we've increased in Title II and III, but Titles I and IV have decreased. And then this, 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 slide, ah, this slide shows all the federal program funding totals over the last four years, so you have an overall view. What questions do you have with title funding before I move to S? All right, so the elementary and secondary school emergency relief, ESSER funding was the federal funding school districts were allocated in response to COVID-19. This slide shows the ESSER II allocation. There are the buckets we divided the funds up for budgeting purposes for DESE. And then here is the ESSER III allocation with spending categories. The one requirement for ESSER three was districts must have reserved at least 20% of, of the funds to address learning loss. Melville reserved over 80% of funding for this requirement. Um, and the next slide will show the budgeting plan. So as we've highlighted this evening, um, we know that we have used the 34 interventionists to per building with ESSER funds to work with students in small groups. Uh, focusing in on those targeted interventions for student growth. We have additional um, materials for ELA and math that were purchased. We have sub-funding available for teachers to attend data teaming and additional funding for supplemental use for that. We also have the after-school clubs and tutoring that were available for teachers um, who were interested 
in sponsoring a club or assisting with tutoring. And then transportation is funded um, through this and it's available for students to utilize these after school programs. The ninth block option for high school um, who may need students who may need credit recovery is now available through this fund. And then funding for a future kindergarten jumpstart program, which would start prior to the school year as part of a plan. Social emotional learning support through Chad's coalition and materials for classrooms used are being funded from this source. And then finally, we have technology upgrades for online learning and the HVAC for better air quality in our schools is coming from these funds. What questions might you have on SR2? I um, would be interested in knowing a little bit more about Kindergarten Jump Start Program. I wrote down the same thing. I saw you write down when I said that, yes. That's so, the only thing I've never heard of <laughs> on this list, so. <laughs> so we do have a line item for this program to be used in the future. Um, it is a program that students would come a few days earlier, those kindergarten students. So there's less students in the, or less students in the building. They're the only ones in the building. Um, we'd have the staff there. Um, so the line item is, is for the staff and materials for that. Um, they'd have the buses, they'd have transportation, they'd have, it'd be a, a normal day. Um, and so we just give them a couple of days extra to be in the building, get acclimated um, to, to the school before the rest of the students. And so this hasn't been used yet, but it's it has not. Thinking. But there's and we future only have, plans with us or funds. We'd have to use it one more year next. Okay. next year. Okay. All right. So, uh, go ahead, sir, may I go? Um, the transportation for after-school clubs and tutoring—that's a problem, isn't it? We don't have enough drivers. Actually, Dan's office has been very creative in helping to get students um, to and from their tutoring and clubs and ninth block. So yes, has it been a struggle for him? Yes, but he is ensuring that all students get what they need. So thank, thank you to the, behind me, yeah, thank you to the transportation department. Thank you yeah. for that and, and a whole lot more, but we won't get into that right now. But this is very enlightening, thank you. Yes, very informational, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Professional Development Report, Dr. Smith. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to present to you tonight. Um, this presentation continues to evolve in terms of trying to put a little lens of continuous improvement on it. So there's more data this year than what you found last year, and we'll continue to try to provide more data and more transparency with regards to all that it is that we do. These are just the bullets of kind of the topics that we'll address here uh, during this presentation, so table of contents, so to speak. We start with um, where does the professional development goals specifically come from? And those come from our, our Melville strategic plan. And so you can see that's obviously started in 21-22, continues through the 25-26 school year. And for those um, both watching at home as well as in the audience, you can see our five themes that we have of personalized student prep, safety, access and opportunity, employee support, as well as effective and efficient. And we do provide professional development opportunities within all five of those themes. We also have to look at how do we get to the creation of a district professional development plan. And there are really three major topics and each time we'll kind of focus on the blue box. So this first one about the analysis of a professional development needs assessment. That is a assessment that we administer on an annual basis to our teaching staff and they give us feedback. And these are the topics, specifically the questions that are asked. Things like, you know, what building do they work in and, and comments they have, but also the identification of, you know, what, what type of person are they? Are they, you know, core teacher? Are they an encore teacher? Um, what are some of the technology things they'd like to consider? There's consistent questions that are asked on an annual basis. And we do look at those, you know, the, the results of those particular um, assessments from the teachers. We do look to see what topics they are interested in. We do plan our development around these particular topics. So that is part of it. 
we also look at the creation of school improvement plans. And so those school improvement plans, you saw a good example tonight of Forder when Dr. Moss stood up here and, and showed you what her goals were as part of the presentation. All of those collectively really lead us into what does the overall district professional development plan look like. So some examples you can see level to level. Um, here are some examples of what are, what's important at the early childhood. Guard readiness skills, early intervention. These are things that I know that you've heard before. Those are part of what the school improvement goals represent at a place like John Kerry. If you look at the elementaries, by and large, you'll see things like increasing student engagement, uh, increasing access to more um, specific areas of intervention beyond just what all kids get, but especially targeted and timely interventions. And also goals like improving proficiency in reading, mathematics, and also being at school. Again, you'll see consistency, I think, in some of the goals K through 12, whereas other goals are maybe a bit more specific. At the middle school level, you can see some examples of the school improvement plans, positive school climate, student engagement, some things that you've heard before. And at the high school level, those become sometimes more locally generated, things like um, a productive, I'm sorry, a personalized learning environment, uh, also you know, local goals um, such as the interventionist usage. We also have statewide and federal goals we have to meet too. Graduation rate, improvement of end of course assessment scores, ACT composite goals, those are things we include at the high school level. Finally, we look at how the overall district professional development plan gets created. And so again, we look at it from a whole school perspective and you can see the goals. If we look at what last year's school improvement plans look like, you'd start to see some more specifics. And, and I'll just use this as you know, some examples. I won't speak to every single point that you see here. But there were things that our schools really wanted to focus on. And those pieces also align to the training and the development, the professional learning that we offer. There's examples of elementary, multi-tiered systems of support. That's the MTSS process. You hear that everywhere. Uh, at the middle school, you've heard classroom universals. You heard Mr. Kern and Ms. Gardner um, you know, talk about that tonight. And at the high school, we see it very specifically in the content, more at the high school as opposed to the middle school or the elementary, um, because everything is very content driven uh, by subject, more than just ninth grade or 10th grade or 11th grade or 12th grade. So it also leads to questions about well, what kinds of experiences are part of this professional development plan. And so we offer experiences, we'll use the elementary as an example, we offer experiences that are both off campus, you know, conferences, things of that that they would attend. We also offer opportunities that are on campus. And so different trainings that we will offer either internally or bring people in during early release days or some of the district professional development days. At the secondary level, again, we do that same kind of work. You'll find that it's a little bit more content driven. Uh, and we also do the more of the locally created PD. Many times comes out of our curriculum committees. And so, you know, over the last year or so, you can see multilingual learners, ELA, math, social studies, uh, whether it's middle school or high school, that's many times high quality professional development when you get people around the table together talking about curriculum, talking about their craft, talking about resources and talking about standards. You also get some opportunities for group experiences through professional development. And so you can see here's a list of some of the big highlighted professional development group things that we do. You've seen these before. You've probably heard of some of these things before. Um, some of these are things we celebrate. Uh, many of them are things that we celebrate. Some of them maybe don't get as much recognition, but they're all important as part of the plan. When we also talk about professional development, we also have to be mindful about the financial resources that are allocated towards that. So we break those down into the term that Marshall likes to use, buckets. So we break them down into our six financial trackers, or buckets. And so we have salaries, and then we have salaries outside of the regular course of the school day. We have Social Security, Medicare. We have the extra duty retirement with Medicare outside of the course of the school day. We have purchases, purchased services, and we also have materials. So that's where the allocation of the total allocation will go into one of those six buckets. So here's a breakdown from what you would have seen if you were to do a financial audit of the 21-22 school year. You would see on the right-hand side of, this, of the display that you have here um, by each individual bucket, 
that would have been a total usage of $456,850. Now, that only represents 39.4% of what was actually originally allocated. And the biggest reason for that, which probably is not a big surprise, is COVID. Because even into last year, when we had five days and 10 days where folks were out, and we had organizations that couldn't come or wouldn't come because of continued um, restrictions with their particular organization, it was a domino effect. So one thing led to another thing, and so when we can't provide purchase services, then we, the substitute teachers get impacted, therefore the extra duty payment may get impacted, and the Medicare may get impacted. So, you know, that was a, it was a year of really trying to shift on a regular basis. It was an improvement from the previous year where we had just a little over 25%. Uh, we do expect, as we get into our financial year 23, FY23, um, you can see our total is in green here at the, at the rate of $927,544. Now that is obviously um, significantly more than what was actually spent in FY22, but it is a reduction from what was originally allocated in FY22. So you can see in the blue box, it covers a lot of things. It covers the things that we mentioned as part of the overall district professional development plan. These cover the goals out of the school improvement plans. It covers the needs assessment you know, pieces, and it also really helps us establish kind of the foundation for our, our district PD plan overall. There are some big buckets that we do have. Um, probably buckets is the wrong uh, line items. It's probably a better way to look at it here. With regards to the building professional development budgets that we allot to our buildings, the conferences that we spend, the amount that we spend on curriculum work, the amount we spend on district professional development days. Those are all listed there, and then the groups would be the various conferences that um, pre-K through 12 that folks would travel to. Um, and so that, that does cover a lot, but you can see kind of the big rocks as part of it. When you get into the benefits, because it's always really important to know what your benefits are when you're talking about professional development. There's a couple of things I want you to keep in mind. One of them is that we know that the most effective professional development occurs when these seven features are met, where it's content focused, active learning, collaboration, effective practices, coaching, expert support, feedback and reflection, and most importantly, when it's of sustained duration. There is also board policy that specifically supports this in GCL. So there's a board policy that has been adopted many a year ago that also supports this particular one. And so those go hand in hand, which is good because it means that our board policies and our plans have alignment. When we look at our district professional development calendar, we see that there's 45 total hours of professional development during the course of the year. 12 of those come through the full days at the beginning of the year, and then the other 33 come throughout the course of early release days or half days when we don't have school for a full day, but half of that time would be spent with uh, professional development, and the other half of the day would be spent with teacher uh, workday concepts. So we get about 45 hours annually, and I bring that up with the last slide. When you, stick, when you take a look at what the state requirements are, highlighted in tan here, you'll see that in order to get your initial certification, you just need 30 hours over four years. We offer 45 hours every year. So we are certainly well above and beyond in terms of what the planning is, and I think districts who have records of high achievement tend to have more hours of professional development for their staff. Whether those are whole days or part days, you know, I think the record that we have with what we offer um, is very much in line with higher performing school districts, which is, I think, where we all want us to be. So I would ask if you have any questions um, specifically around the professional development plan. Very detailed as always. Thank you, Brian. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, the first thing I have is Prop R, the annual report. Um, 
had an agenda write up, which if you've had a chance to read, we'll go into a lot of detail, but I'll give a quick recap. Um, this year, uh, and the handout that I've got is really for uh, two agendas down, that's for the insurance renewal, so that's not related to this. Um, so back to the Prop R report. Um, this year's report for fiscal year 22 shows that the targeted Prop R items had $6.3 million of spending um, on those specific targets, which left uh, $1.7 million on just other general operations for the full $8 million. Uh, the $6.3 million is actually a little higher than what we had a year ago at $5.9 million. Uh, we've got other, we use that other operational money for other needs, uh, things like salaries and benefits due to the inflation um, and various other operating expenses as our needs change and we get farther away from uh, prop R days. On the targets, when you're looking at the numbers, you'll see we're under um, prop R target in areas of buses and textbooks and professional development, but we're really meeting all of our needs in there in those areas. Prop R had a target of 10 buses, and really our target normally every year for buses is only five. So there's, we've met our need, there's no use to spend more money. Same thing with textbooks, they're cyclical, so some years are more than others. We basically met our needs with the buses, textbooks, and And from year to year, as we do spend in other areas, those will always be money that are spent according to the plan budget expenses board each year. So it doesn't vary into other other areas that are not approved. So really, that's all I have for the Prop R report. Questions. I don't think anybody has any questions, so we're good. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Marshall. Very thorough, as always. Next, we have Consider Employee Benefits Consultant Contract. All right. Our current contract is with USI, and this expires on December 31st of this year. So um, we put out a bid, uh, received four bids, and USI came in thousand dollars per year the next lowest bid was eighty five thousand so, um, we're very happy with USI services I think they've done a great job and in the lower bid I think uh, combination of job and contract to, uh, to USI Anybody have any questions, comments? I know we've all, anybody that's been on the insurance committee has worked with USI and they always come with data, knowledge, and information to keep us all informed. So, if yeah, I second that. I sat in on one of the meetings and I was sitting next to the two USI reps and they were definitely contributing, proving their uh, information with good data, and they definitely seemed interested in making sure that we were getting good value for our money. So from that interaction alone, they certainly seem to be doing the right job, and if they're lowest bidder, then that's a double win. I think so. So we need to do a motion, I think. Okay, so if I could please get a motion to approve the consulting contract of USI effective 1-1-23. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. All right, thank you. Uh, next we have insurance renewals and report. All right, so um, on the insurance, just uh, a quick reminder on a couple of key fundamentals. Our self we're self-insured, and uh, that year runs on a calendar year basis as opposed to our normal school fiscal year that runs through June 30th every year. So we run on a calendar year basis, and we have about a $2.5 million estimated minimum balance that we need 
at the end of every December 31st. The theory on that is if you theoretically stop the plan on December 31st, you would still have roughly $2.5 million claims that you'd have to pay out of that fund after December 31st for services that were performed up through the 31st. So when you're looking at fund balance, you might as well just deduct 2.5 million from that fund balance because it's already spoken for the claims that will be coming through. So that's, some people think that, you know, the fund balance is really higher than what it really is. So that's important to realize. Quick, uh, very quick run through on history because it's important to understand the history. Our fund balance had declined five years in a row through 2013 and increased six years in a row through 2019 because of some significant rate increases that we had for 2015. So in 2020, we had the first year of decline. The fund balance declined 358,000. And then in 2021, the fund balance accelerated to a decline of 937,000. And then in 2022 here, the estimated decline right now is $2.1 million for the year, uh, with our claims currently being up about 23% for the year. So uh, we met with the insurance uh, committee and with USI and a lot of um, Analysis and review, and we're going to add. The plan is to add 2.4 million dollars to the self-insurance bucket with the following changes. So the district rate would actually increase 22 percent. The uh, spouse subsidy, uh, there's 50 dollar spouse subsidy uh, that would be eliminated for the OAPN and the HSA plans, and that finishes that off. We eliminated part of that year ago, and this eliminates the remainder of that. The child rate would go up $10 per month, which is the first time we've changed the child rate in over 10 years. And then there's a couple of coverages that would change slightly. The ER copay would go from 250 to $350. The specialist copay would go from 50 to 60 The urgent care copay would go from 50 to 75 so with those changes, we estimate that we would increase $2.4 million going into the self-insurance bucket. And even with that, we're still projecting a 2023 net loss of $433,000, but that's still a lot better than the 2022 projection $2.1 million loss. So it slows the loss down and it leaves us with a projected fund balance in, at the end of 2023 of $6.1 million, which is $1.3 million less than the minimum target uh, fund balance that we put into put a 10-year plan in place back in 2020. And for the year of 2023, the minimum targeted fund balance was $7.4 million, so we'd still be $1.3 million underneath that target even with changes. But these changes are a good first step. These changes are the least impacting as is possible to our employees because these rate increases are really hitting on the district side and, um, and not the employee-only coverage. There's no rate change for the employee-only coverage. And even uh, with the rate increases, put in for this current year, that still did not affect the employee-only coverage. So we have not affected them since 2015. <coughs> With these changes, it increases the district cost for each employee by $1,656. Currently, the district pays $8,047 per employee for benefits, and this increases that number to 9703 because we also have to pay a retirement pension on the value of benefits as well as the salary, it also increases our pension expense a little bit, around $75,000 for the year. So the net impact to this year's budget with these changes is fiscal year 22 budget would increase an 
additional $543,000 pension expense would increase an additional $75,000. But that's offset by some very favorable tax revenue that we found out in August that we're going to get. I'll be presenting that to you in the September tax hearing because personal property increased an unprecedented 31.5% this, in this year's value, assessed values. That's going to drive $3.4 million additional revenue for this current year. So fiscal year 22 will have $3.4 million additional tax revenue over what we budgeted, which will more than offset the $550,000 increase to health insurance. That's, that's very, very good news. And I think with that $3.4 million minus the health insurance impact, that leaves us still with a $2.8 million net surplus so far. And then, of course, we don't know what else will, will happen this year. So we'll have to wait and see. But if we don't have any other major negative things happening, I think another very real uh, consideration that we have to look at later on this year is potentially transferring $1.3 million out of the general funds into the self-insurance fund because, once again, if you've got that $2 million short on the insurance side, it's a wonderful opportunity to shore up the insurance fund. But that would be a conversation later on this year after we see how things are tracking and making sure there's no other large negative surprise. So, um, are there any questions? I will assume that the finance, I mean, the insurance committee came up with the proposal for the changes and that everybody, that all the stakeholders sort of had their input. Well, we had discussions with the insurance committee, but this is pretty complex stuff, really, to try to figure out what the value is of even changes. So USI was a big driver in, in assisting us to just say, okay, if you do this, you'll have this much savings, and if you do this and this and this. But really, as you can see on the changes, we really have minimal coverage changes. Coverage changes right. is only about $100,000, and it's really minimal impact to the employees. So I think the employees were very happy to understand that they had very little impact really the district uh, that will be, bear a lot of this, and unfortunately the retirees, because you can't get away from the retirees bearing you know, the district portion, because any time you increase district rates, you're increasing the retirees. So yeah, the, the insurance committee had no problem at all with these changes, because any other option would have hit the employees much harder. Right, okay. Anybody else? If I can get a motion to approve the coverage and rate changes for health insurance as outlined on the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Jean and Patrick. Strategic plan update safety. Dr. DeKemper and Officers, are you Officer Ziegler? I, am. I hear about you all the time, so now so, I finally okay. put a <laughs> no. face to the name. All so, good things, all good things. So thank you. I was going to introduce him before I began. This is Sergeant Zach Ziegler, who supervises our SRO, and I just wanted, um, in addition to being grateful that he could join me tonight for the presentation, to offer a public thank you to his work and to the work of his officers, as well as secondary officers, for their unwavering commitment to the Melville School District and all that you do. Thank you. And so. And he does talk good about you all the time. That's how I knew your name. He always <laughs> refers to you when we ask questions. So thank you. It's good to put a face with it. Yeah. So her work continues. And if you think back to the strategic plan, the major components of the strategic plan, plan as they relate to Facilities includes front entrances, improving air quality, increased traffic flow, perimeter safety, exterior lighting, ADA accessibility, classroom safety, and updating our restrooms. So we've been very busy, as you know. 
Um, thank you to Jessica Papillo and her team for doing such a wonderful job documenting the progress that has been made. You've probably seen this image before and after Oakville High School with a security vestibule that has been added. We have other security vestibules and construction that continues to take place. We meet weekly with the contractors behind that work so that we can see how it's progressing, ask questions, try to resolve any issues that may come up, and really credit to Mike Gig and his team for being a part of those and a leading voice as well. So we also had HVAC improvements. Um, the teachers in those buildings have expressed gratitude for those upgrades. And you know we continue to look at traffic flow across the district. Just last week, Dr. Gaines had us on the roof of a building early in the morning so that we could see what drop off looked like and we'll continue to make adjustments to try to make that safe beyond the facilities themselves. There are times when as we do parking lot construction, we expect to have to renovate some of the lighting, but as you know, that was not uh, kept in the priorities. So we're fixing what we need to um, in the context of that construction and we hope to revisit that in future years. The bathrooms that are being renovated are brought up to code, so we see some ADA improvements, for example, at Oakville High School, and last year we added some additional keypads to keep doors from being propped open. I wanna thank Paul Westbrook and his team. As you know, we have a five-year plan for implementing uh, security cameras. They are complete in their work for all of the 2022 schools. There's still some conversation about external cameras that's going on, but they really worked hard throughout the summer and the beginning of the school year to add cameras to Melville uh, where needed to Washington Middle School and to Oakville Middle School. The principals have expressed a lot of gratitude for those cameras and I was at Rogers today and we were explaining the process and Dr. Kinoe was equally excited about the possibility next summer of cameras being added. We'll continue that work through 2025. And one of the big focuses of the Safety Academy that I recently attended in Jefferson City, which was sponsored by the Center for Educational Safety, was what are the MSIP 6 requirements that will be placed on school districts? I was relieved to see that a lot of the work that is required is work that we've already started or that we have been implementing for some time. One of the kind of editorial revisions that I'll have to do this year is to take our district crisis plan and convert it into an emergency operations plan that has been recommended by DESI, but the content is there. Um, I will continue to participate in workshops and trainings through the Center for Educational Safety. As I mentioned, I attended the academy, and then we had some of the folks from the academy come and provide training to the district for behavioral risk assessments, which, as you know, was uh, prompted by uh, updated board policy requiring us to have threat assessment. That was done last year. Um, we continue to have physical safety site inspections. So, you know, Sergeant Sigler has joined me for those in the past, and we had a, a district safety and facilities committee that brought first responders and other uh, individuals with different backgrounds, whether it be IT or transportation or just different lenses into every one of our campuses and took a look um, at some of the needs of those schools, and that paralleled some of the work that was done by the facility steering committee. So those observations and that input helped shape Prop S. And so we continue to honor that work. We have a tracking system in real time for emergency drills that are completed at the schools. Dr. Bresler and I are constantly monitoring that. Paul and his team already have a comprehensive cybersecurity plan in place, so I feel really good there. One of the things that I participated in was a focus group around courage to report over the summer. That is an anonymous tip line. So it's required that districts have an anonymous tip line through MSIP 6. We have been doing that for three years now. And then finally, just continued participation and professional development on safety training and violence prevention. I'll turn it over to Sergeant Segler to talk about school resource officers. Thank you. So uh, Melville has seven school resource officers, and uh, my office is in, uh, I supervise those officers as, long, as well as the officers at the Hancock School District. So um, as Director Gilman said, one of the toughest things we're going through is, is hiring as well, and it's, it's, it's tough to get staff. So I feel really lucky in the group of resource officers that you have here. 
Um, when you get into the business that I'm in, very few people uh, foresee themselves becoming a school resource officer. You know, it's, it's more, you know, they're coming into it for law enforcement, so that's not the first thing, you know, that they have on their wish list. So sometimes it's tough to fill those, fill those positions. Um, in our case, um, we have a group of veteran officers who are all parents, who some of them come from educator backgrounds as well, and are, are very dedicated to this. You know, this is, this is kind of their, their life. And uh, beyond this, if they move on to other things, they've all stressed that they want to do something, in, you know, involving children. So uh, very happy to have them as, as your group. Um, so we, once, once these officers are chosen within the first year, they have to attend uh, a training from an organization called NASRO. It's the National Association for School Resource Officers. It's kind of the standard as far as training for officers go. They go through a 40 hour course within the first year. Some of the things that they talk about are the on, you know, current litigation that goes on, how to become an informal counselor, um, how to de-escalate situations and working with children base as opposed to the adults that they typically work with. Um, so we have them go through that for the, in the first year. And then our department offers additional training for them solely for their position, uh, specifically that deals with intruder training. So our department has a very vast uh, kind of the standard in the St. Louis area, at least maybe in the Missouri area, as far as intruder training goes through. Was, our department was one of the first that actually included that training as part of our, our, as our mandatory training. So our, our SROs go to that as well as specific training for them yearly. Um, our main goal as uh, school resource officers is to provide a safe learning environment for the students. So when we go in, that's, that's the first thing we do is that is what our job is. To, to be there to provide a safe learning environment. So we do that through a few ways, and the, the biggest way is just presence, just being there, you know, a, a, an officer in a uniform, a police car there. So if God forbid somebody comes to the school with nefarious intentions, um, they're going to see that they're, you know, we have a police officer there at the school. So that is their first goal. Um, that's not their only goal. Obviously, we're there to enforce any laws um, that may be broken. One of the things, um, when we see issues with school resource officers throughout the country, we are not there to enforce discipline. So school discipline isn't necessarily something that's against the law. So that's one thing that I um, really am strict with my officers is like, you cannot enforce school discipline. That, that's for the teachers, that's for the administrators to do. We come in if a law has been broken. Um, then from there, you know, we can, can kind of consider them an informal counselor. You know, they're there for, to be a, another adult for kids to talk to. Um, it's an opportunity for us as police to kind of be humanized. We're kind of like, you know, most people see us as kind of robots, I think, oftentimes. So this is an opportunity for us to be humanized in front of, in front of the kids and, and build a good relationship. So those are, those are our main goals. Is there any, any questions you have about school resource officers? Or? community and the fact that you engage with the students obviously makes that relationship they have with you helpful because they'll obviously feel safe to come to you if there's an issue as well as obviously help strengthen that relationship that kids can have with police that they don't necessarily have a good relationship in their private life so I mean it, it there's so many different bonuses to this we're really glad that you guys are in the environment and helping out oh we really appreciate it like I said, I'm very proud of the officers that I have in there, and I try to instill upon them the education factor, too, that we can also help them with issues that are going on, especially with social media and things that, that can cause them trouble or things that they might have just questions in general when it comes to, you know, not just things at school, but a lot of things that come up are issues that they're having at home, you know, illegal activity at home, abuse and things like that, that oftentimes one of the first things they come to is the if they have a good rapport with the SRO is the SRO. So we find a lot of things that not only are going on at your schools, but are also going on in the areas that we cover, that we get from the students from the school. That's great to hear, thank you. I have yes, a family member at Bernard, and to hear it from her, Officer Mike can walk on water. Yes. 
Okay. Yeah, he's got a pretty good singing voice. He displays it sometime at the school. So he's been around for a very long time. Yeah, he's uh, great. Officer Mike. So um, he's from the South County area. He has kids in your district. So he definitely has a vested interest. Yeah, he's wonderful. Thank you for all you do. My pleasure. So um, relationship is critical. And it was asked at a previous board meeting if there was safety training taking place as teachers come back to school for the new school year. I snapped this picture last week. This was at Point Elementary, and it's Officer Sam Lang. And she is providing an overview of safety practices for Point in reference to their crisis plan and also an update on 4E training and just building that relationship and going over what teachers can do to help keep the school safe as long as, as well as what her roles and responsibilities are. And I also have, um, I have to bring up the topic of secondary officers. We continue to rely on numerous secondary officers serving our district in an ongoing capacity. Last year, we were very grateful that the board decided to increase the wage of the secondary officers to $35 per hour. However, we've seen some recent competition between districts as secondary officers and many of our surrounding districts have increased the hourly wage of secondary officers to $40 an hour. So I would respectfully request the board consider to increase the wages so that we remain competitive. My recommendation would be that we increase $40 per hour for secondary officers. And with that, uh, we're happy to answer any questions that you have as you discuss. So it's up to you. Um, last year, with a similar presentation, the board was able to discuss. If you would like me to obtain some more information for you so you can make a decision in a future board meeting, we can do that as well. I think definitely. I mean, we, we obviously, it's a finite resource we have with officers. And if we're in competition, we obviously have to try and be competitive as we are trying for all other positions amongst the uh, districts. So I think we should definitely entertain the idea. Chad, Chad uh, talked to me about that, and I think the I think the rough impact is maybe about seventeen thousand dollars expense to the district. But uh, Chad and I also talked about there are other aspects of scheduling that I believe is going to recoup that full seventeen thousand dollars. So, in my opinion, I think financially we're good. Okay, that's good enough for me. So can we make, make a motion to approve that, Dr. Gaines? Okay. I'd like, oh, could I make okay. that motion? Um, sure. I'd like to make a motion that we raise our secondary officer salary to $40 an hour. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry, I just didn't know if I was allowed to do it right then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now moving on to the process update. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, PropS, kind of take it building by building. We'll start at Beer Bomb. Uh, that project's being done by Wright Construction, and as we talked about before, that project's going to go uh, kind of throughout the year. Now, although most people saw the demolition of and the front end of the building um, happened over the summer, there were still some demolition to complete in the boiler room. Uh, so that has been completed. So now all of the demolition uh, that was gonna take place in the building is done. On the outside of the building, however, uh, we have started to come back up um, out of that demolition. We've got the foundation wall that's poured up uh, kind of on the the west side of uh, where the new stuff is going to be, the, the new front end that sits up against the building, uh, that's been poured as well as the uh, retaining wall that sits along there. And all of that has been backfilled now. So 
really what we're waiting kind of to happen is uh, we've got to go through the settling and compaction and meet all the testing requirements for that uh, before we're able to come in uh, and put in the foundations and the floor slab. Uh, so we've kind of got a waiting and testing period for that to happen. Uh, but I think that seems to be uh, kind of moving ahead of where we thought it would uh, initially. Uh, because Wright did a lot of compaction kind of as they started uh, really even before we poured that, that foundation wall. Uh, so that's moving along pretty good. Elementary uh, parking lot at, well, the parking lot at Oakville Elementary, which is being done by Castle. If, if there is a project that to date has gone about as smoothly as possible, it's been this one. Um, however, um, supply chain issues have begun to impact this because we've got to do uh, we have to do some bricks around a trash enclosure, and uh, the bricks are taking longer to get than what we're gonna what we thought. Um, so um, they've got the the north end um, of the parking lot. All the storm tech system is in, um, and uh, if you've been by recently, uh, especially over last weekend, there was a lot of concrete work um, that was done around the building. There's concrete work going on uh, this week, kind of putting in sidewalks, and uh, if you will, kind of putting in the curbs around the exterior of where all the asphalt will be. Um, so we anticipate that as long as the weather cooperates, uh, Oakville Elementary should get done a little bit ahead of our original completion date. So uh, perhaps uh, the middle of next month, uh, we may be uh, very close to uh, wrapping up at Oakville Elementary and able to uh, open up our lot for uh, drop off and pick up Go to Blades Elementary. Uh, that project's being done by Aspire. Uh, kind of got things moved all over in the building. Um, there are some temporary walls up um, around the old uh, music room. It's kind of well as the old office space and the classroom. It's being converted to a health office. Um, as of right now, we anticipate that the health office will be completed first. Uh, so that we can move into that space and then begin begin renovation of the existing health office. Um, the old office area teacher workroom would probably uh, wrap up next. And then last would be the new offices and the corresponding entrance um, and the classroom, small classroom piece um, that will be where the old entrance uh, will last. But uh, this project has been moving along pretty well. We kind of got, I'd say, delayed by that unexpected rainstorm one day, but uh, they were getting ready to uh, pour the piers and it rained and all that back in with mud. Uh, so, moving along. Um, Oakville High School, um, for the most part, I mean, everything there is fully functional. We just got to uh, swap out the correct partitions uh, there to kind of wrap all of that up. Uh, Bernard is being done by Integra. Um, and with the storefront, that's where we've been hit by supply chain issues with our artists. Uh, we were talking, actually, we were talking with Wright Construction earlier this week um, in relation to the delays on doors and windows and you know, what kind of lead time is there to order these. Um, and right now it's running at 20 to 22 weeks, uh, doors and windows. Um, so that's what's causing the delays at Bernard Middle, um, as well as Oakville Elementary uh, and Rogers. So the lower lot, the parking lot piece at Rogers is complete. Um, we. They were going to put in uh, some new striping for kind of playground areas 
on uh, kind of the east side of the lot. Um, we're gonna, we've asked them to, to not do that, pending our ability to go in and uh, seal that entire east side of the parking lot and then come back with all of the painted lines on top of the new seal. Uh, it probably won't happen until the spring or early summer. Uh, so next up in the queue for uh, Prop S stuff, uh, we have the baseball fields here at Melville High School. We expect to have those bids to the board um, at the October 20th meeting. Uh, so hopefully we can get going on this project around the 1st of November. Uh, we've got another big, uh, kind of a larger powwow with more people on that project uh, next Thursday. Um, Talk about construction staging um, as well as uh, kind of other pieces. One of the things that we've included uh, kind of in that the ball field piece um, after uh, feedback from our, our coaching staff and folks in the athletic department um, is kind of a dugout and kind of around home plate configuration uh, much like uh, Webster Groves has as well as how the, um, they use some fencing uh, kind of coordinate between the baseball and softball fields. Uh, kind of looking at that as an alternate. Uh, beer bomb phase two, uh, the classroom edition, will be sometime in the winter, uh, early in 2023 probably. As well as Trout, Wine, Hageman, and Washington was the original. Now we think we're gonna pull a point into that. However, as we kind of looked at those projects and we begin to um, think about those a little bit more, it's possible that we restructure uh, that bid package and it may become Trout, Wine, Hageman, and Point. Washington's going to be a little bit more complex and maybe doing it uh, potentially as a stand. So we'll, we'll see that we're still having conversations there. And as typical, um, just seeing uh, where we are, uh, and, you know, we're, we're now at the point uh, with kind of really into construction and moving on. Uh, it'll slow down a little bit uh, because we're, we've got some projects completed, but we spent about two million in the last month um, on Prop S projects. Uh, but you know, interest rates are going up, so we're seeing a little bit of increase on the interest income side. So, that, so that's helpful. Uh, but that's kind of where we are with Prop S, um, and I'll try to answer any questions you have. But for that, although not Prop S, um, we are moving uh, forward. We, uh, we expect that we'll be uh, bidding uh, probably the phase one renovations to uh, the 2900 building also sometime So when you refer to a powwow at the Melville High School Fields, um, did you pull in, I know that was the one project you thought you might want some outside expertise. Did you pull somebody else in or? Yeah, I've been able to talk to some, to some folks. So I think we're feeling pretty decent about where we are. And have we put out a request for proposal for a project manager employee? Or? Not yet. Um, because we're looking at kind of doing that, being able to start someone in January, we're going to advertise in October. Okay. Or kind of towards the end of this month. Yeah, and you said that. First part of October. Yeah, I forgot about that. Sorry about that. Okay, great. Thank you. And really targeting kind of um, the December board meeting for sure to, to try to make a decision. Maybe, maybe the November, but probably just the December. Okay, great. Anybody else? Hopefully the bricks are the last thing we have to have for a delay at OES. I mean, we, oh, between well, I the mean, permitting and everything else, I mean, we've literally run out of things that we could get delayed on. I mean, that one's not going to be a huge issue because it's not a massive delay, but you know, everything else has gone so well for them. They're kind of like, oh my gosh, we got something that's causing us trouble. So, uh, but the, the castle team uh, has been, our, our belief is they, they've done really well. 
mean, I've driven by it on a weekly basis, and you can definitely see it on a weekly basis, the progress they make. Yeah, it's very visible there. Okay. Uh, moving on to future ballot issue, I. All right. So, you know, we've talked about these community decisions um, over the last couple of meetings, you know, started in June. Um, but as we think about it, to some extent, we've kind of really been rethinking around, is it really just a question of what kind of school district does the community want? And okay. we think out, think out, you know, seven or eight years to 2030 or even beyond that, what kind, of school, what kind of school does the community want in the next 10 to 15 years? Think about our existing strategic plan um, takes us out um, about another four. This is just started year two of our current strategic plan. So, you know, in May of 21, we first introduced, when we adopted the uh, ESSER plan, just knowing that in order to keep those supports by beyond FY24, we're going to take additional resources. We really started laying that out then. We had a conversation in June. We had another conversation uh, last month. At that point, we asked what kind of you needed for information to help make a decision. We kind of lined out some big picture items. And here we provide kind of in general what those big picture items are and about when uh, that information would be coming. So when we think about interventionists, a little bit in the PD report, we have a little bit in the building reports that are coming, um, but we'll also have um, information in November when we do the student preparation report. The, the ESSER funds, you know, that's kind of a piece we, we've seen kind of all along. We gave a breakdown of those um, last month. Uh, Dr. Larkin talked a lot about that tonight with the federal programs. And then, to some extent, the building reports also talk about how they're using ESSER funds. Um, in terms of salary data, you know, we just had some rough teacher data um, last month. I kind of add to that a little bit in this report. Um, but we're really, um, the employee support report is in December. Um, so we'll have that there. The classified piece is a little bit more complicated, uh, as well as um, how to gather administrator data as well and that will hook into you know also in December what it's going to require what it's going to be what's going to be required to be competitive um, although again with the teacher get, just have some rough stuff um, ask about class size comparisons every typically in October uh, we do a staffing and enrollment report that will have that in County ballot measures, I've got that in this presentation tonight, as well as voter survey. Um, our communications department has been working with the folks that have done surveys for us in the past. Uh, we're shooting to do those surveys at their um, recommendation, wait until after the uh, election is over um, to be able to do that. People are kind of bombarded uh, with phone calls and stuff around election leading up to the November election. Um, so doing that in November and having the results of those surveys for the December uh, board meeting. So kind of going back to last time, you know, our, our assessed valuation is roughly 2.3 billion. Um, and what does a penny generate? These are the same numbers as last time once our assessed value is final, final. We can uh, kind of update these a little bit. And again, seen this before, Dr. Trevor Larkin talked about the ESSER budget. But if we look at the ESSER pieces that are not HVAC, that would take roughly 16 cents to generate that amount. That's the, that's kind of the this year amount. Um, you know, some of those would, especially um, what we've seen in terms of increased salaries and the, the cost of materials um, kind of going up. And we lined out kind of what that is kind of piece by piece, uh, kind of in that. We also talked last time about competitive wages. Um, last time, the Lindbergh number was an FY22 number. So 
We've been able to update that. Still, it's roughly, uh, we're roughly 2,000 below the average starting salary for these folks. Um, so again, roughly 800 teachers, that's about 1.6 million in salary. But with benefits, you know, especially since insurance just went up, um, you know, we're talking um, going up $1,600 employee. So we're looking at at least 1.9 million in that. And so it would take roughly just about nine cents to generate that. However, that's if we made that move in the current year, right? That in a way? If we made that move in the current year. Oh, yeah, okay. It doesn't take into account what the escalating costs for next year might be or beyond. So as we think ahead to December and salary pieces, what we're looking at, we'll have the county data, um, and then we'll also narrow that down. If you think back um, several years, we really were looking at how we compared to just a handful of districts who at that time uh, we were losing the most people to, uh, kind of in that regard. And as I kind of mentioned, support staffs are a little more, salaries are a little bit more complicated. And we also need to gather uh, administrative salary. So, you know, we kind of updated one line from where this was last month, that roughly nine cents, which is admittedly a very rough and likely low estimate um, in that regard, and still having kind of an open-ended on classified salaries, but you know, just a wild, you know, that's probably gonna be somewhere between kind of that halfway up point on certified salaries. So probably somewhere four and a half, five cents plus would be very, very rough again, and potentially uh, So, you know, when you add all of those up, you get something getting something closer into that 30 cent range. Um, that's kind of how a 30 cent uh, increase might impact homes of varying values. So I mentioned we have the county ballot data. So kind of got to look at that in a few lenses as well as some ballot data of ours. So if we look across the county at bond and levy issues that districts have placed uh, going back about 10 years, uh, you can see that here. The, if it is in red, it did not pass. Right. Not successful. And you'll see all the way to the right in the last column 22, uh, the Parkway one highlighted in yellow, that's a November ballot. Right? So they're asking for $265 million bond in November. So that's the bond and levy. If we narrow that down to just the levy ballots over about the last 10 years, we've, well, let me go back for just a second. So on average, if we look across the county, it's a, roughly about five to six districts are gonna have something on the ballot um, every year. If we look at the levy side, it's more like one to two might have something on the levy side. Um, every year across the county. And again, you can see the, the ones in red uh, have not passed. You can see some years there just seems to be uh, more people go to the ballot uh, box in those years. If you look at that kind of by district in a little bit different uh, view, uh, the ones with the red arrows are the ones uh, that did not pass. And all but one of those, I know there's been conversation in the past, but all but one of those um, that didn't pass was over 50 cents. You know, a lot of people think a 50 cent mark is, is a level of threshold. So, you know, the conversations that we've been having are landing around that, are definitely under that 50 cent mark uh, from what we've talked about thus far. If you look at us and you go back 50 years um, and look at our ballot issues that would support operations, you can see multiple attempts, uh, especially a lot in 1970. Um, and you can see that most of those were unsuccessful. Um, and you know, 
you know, the, if you have heard me in the past say that, you know, whether it's an organization or an individual, we are the sum of our choices. And at, for the district, some of those choices are made by the community, and they certainly impacted how we move forward, right? So that whole notion of we ask the community for something, the community makes the decision, and the district has to recalculate from there. Maybe we ask for something again in the future, or maybe we don't ask for something for a long time. All of that comes with some recalculation. So if you think about time and, and trust, and you look at the grid that I just showed, you can layer that with our stuff around facility ask as well. But if you look at repeated failures at the ballot box for facility issues in the mid to late 90s, that led to a lease. Because a lease requires a lower voter threshold than a bond issue. But when that lease was passed, it kind of handcuffed the district relative to our ability to make facilities improvements. But it wasn't like awful. It just handcuffed us a little bit. However, when our operating levy failed in 2006, that led to a tax transfer in 2008. And that one really handcuffed our ability to make facility improvements. Now, although in, you know, retrospect, both of those decisions handcuffed us. When you look at the history of the district, those were the best options available to the board at the time because the community kept saying no, so the district had to recalculate. Right? So that's just been the case all along. And if we look at the history of ballot issues in Melville, what we see that those community decisions over time, when you look at our financial dashboard, have resulted in us being at the bottom of the county on almost every financial measure <coughs> in terms of financial <coughs> inputs from our community. As well as, we have some of the most outdated facilities in St. Louis County. Not the most, but some of the most. I mean, Mosaic, which is St. John. St. John, that building, turns 100 this year. So as we think about overtime and trust, and we think about the Prop R report that was given tonight, have we built community trust with how we've used Prop R funds? how we said we were gonna use them how, versus how we've used them. Have we built community trust with Prop A? Prop A is limited to HVAC and roofing. That's what we've spent it on. Will we build community trust with Prop S? Sadly, with construction escalation, we're gonna be, be able to do all we may have wanted to, but are we gonna be able to deliver on as much as we can? And if that's the case, if we built trust, then how might the community trust us the next time we ask for something? Right. So, as we've lined out before, if we look at kind of these six broad and general ideas around where we could ask and the timeline for each of those, we are getting closer and closer to a decision if we want to go something on the ballot in April. We have to make that decision basically by the latter part of January. Or do we wait till August? Or do we wait till November? On those pieces. So we've kind of started laying out uh, kind of wrapped it up late today, um, kind of looking at, looking at all this in a little bit different look. We'll probably have that for you next month. But essentially, if we think about ESSER-funded positions and ESSER-funded activities, 
We have four opportunities to go to voters before those funds go away. So if those are things that we want to do, we've got a limited window to do those. If we think about overall competitive wages and the possibility to ask for that, well, that's almost unlimited, right? We can ask for those anytime. Yes, or monies go away, so those pieces are going to go away. And then the timing around bond issues becomes a little bit more interesting, but we think we have started to frame out what may work kind of in that regard. So again, when, when might decisions be made and for those next four kind of opportunities for those ballot issues and the information that will be rolled out um, over the coming months. So with that, we'll try to answer any questions that you might have. I have a somewhat leading or obvious question, but if we wanted to put something out for our ESSER positions, it would make sense to do it sooner to like put our employees at ease, right? Because we don't want to get too late to, you know, right? Does that make sense? It does. Okay. So one of the things that is possible that kind of hit at what you're talking about is we could ask in April of 23, or let's, let's say that all of the ESSER stuff, right, is roughly 16 cents. Probably need to escalate that, so let's just say 20, right, just to have a number. We could ask for that 20 in April of 23 that doesn't hit the tax rolls until the year the money goes. That makes sense? Because, so, April of 23 is still in FY23. We have the money for FY24. So the money would become available in FY25. So it would hit the tax rolls hit in the fall of 2020. But we could put that on the ballot as early as 23. So at the Finance Committee meeting last week, we did engage the Finance Committee to help us with strategizing and data um, moving forward. We started talked about them presenting to us sort of an a la carte way to look at this so that we could then package the items that we want to include when, and I mean, they won't make the decision when, we would have to do that, obviously. Um, to figure out the best way to present it to the public so that hopefully it will pass. And also, I, I feel strongly about engaging the Finance Committee um, on these things because they are the community and they, that helps us build trust, I hope, with the rest of the community when they know that the Finance Committee, which is made up of CPAs, um, are working independently to oversee what we're doing as a district. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that information. They will work with Marshall and Dr. Gaines to sort of pull stuff together for us to also look at in addition to all of Dr. Gaines' presentations. And how soon could we expect to hear from on Mar that? Marshall? <laughs> uh, there. It, it depends on the, like, the salary targets. I, right. I, Right, and so I mean they they understand times sure. of the essence, but yeah. there's a lot of data to pull together yet. Um, I did have one question that isn't really looking forward; it's looking backward. But I, it occurred to me: um, why did the lease leases? I don't know how you call that that passed. Why did that handcuff us exactly? I don't understand that. Couldn't spend it for what we needed it for. All right, so, so it gets a little deeper in the school finance, right? So when you pass, when you do a bond, that bond has its own 
Designation. bank account, if you will, to own fund that as serves as that debt levy. And really, you've got the ability, I know this sounds a little odd, but a district can tax whatever it takes to pay that bond off, right? So everybody, like, oh, you know, we're gonna do 20 cents or, you know, ours is 12 and our 12 will hold without any trouble. But if you had to, you have the ability to raise that with a bond. It happens on occasion, but not very often. Happened quite a bit around 2008 to 2010 as assessed values fell, and districts had to raise there. So, bond levy. So, what happened would happen when you do that bond levy calculation? I mean, for, for, for previous districts of mine, it would come out here, but I only needed to tax this much. So, in reality, we were voluntarily rolling back the tax rate over what we had the authority to do each and every year. And because of the way bond works, it allowed for cyclical investments with that same tax rate. The lease works nowhere near that. The lease is a tax levy increase that funds out of your operating what happens is if that rate amount is not enough to meet the obligation of the debt, you don't have the ability to raise the levy to meet that obligation. But what you have to do is take from the operations of the district because you still have to meet those obligations. So one of the things that happened for us was we had to move money out of operations to fund that debt because the levy wasn't enough way out from passage. And so with that roughly 49 cents that folks passed in 2000, for 20 years, we couldn't do anything else with that 49 cents. With a bond, if you had a bond of 49 cents, you're looking to be able to make, be able to do cyclical bond issues every four to seven years, still maintaining that levy. So if you look at the ballot measures leading up to that and repeated failure, repeated failure, repeated failure, but every one of those, the vote was over 50%, which would have passed a lease. That was the only option left for the district to make an investment in facilities. So while it may have handcuffed us down the road, it was kind of like the only thing left for the district to be able to make those investments. And so at that time, the district still had a, a debt levy and had the ability to do another bond issue, but chose not to, you know, kind of beyond that 2000 mark. But then in 2006, I asked for an operating levy. That failed, but as that debt was being paid down, district selected to move roughly 32 cents of that debt levy into operations. And then, so that lowered our ability to use that debt levy for continued investment. But again, that was probably the decision that was there for the board and the community to make because the community had said no repeatedly. So all of those decisions that, you know, in previous presentations, I mean, we've showed ballot stuff going back to the 50s. All of those decisions over time have put us in this position where all of our financial measures are some of the lowest in the county terms of local community inputs and spend per child. Okay. Anybody else? Alrighty.
think that's it. Thank you. Um, now we're going to move on to action items by consent. Does anybody have anything to pull? If I could get a motion to approve action items by consent A through I. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Sorry, that is such a long. So now we're going to move on to communications. Standing committee reports. Does anybody have anything? I think we covered finance with what we were discussing with the tax levy, so I think we're good there. Oh, right. I already brought that up. Anybody else? It's not a committee, but um, the SSD uh, parent. What is it called? PAC. 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 Well, what does it stand for? The PAC. Parental Advisory. Parents Advisory. Council. Parents Advisory Committee. Something like that. It's for SSD. Pat and I went, and it was really great. So it was just like the first meeting. So I didn't know if anybody wanted to know more about that. I also say you saved me. I have the the SSD Governing Council meets on Monday. Um, but I really wanted to thank Adam for all of his work on that. I mean, a lot of people put in a lot of work prior to the, not prior, I guess prior to the first meeting to get it done. It's not like they just like decided to meet for the first time a month ago. Like it's been continually working on it to get it back. And now our district has representation, which is great. And I don't get yelled at at the governing council meeting. So it's a big move for me. Appreciate that, Adam. And uh, appreciate the two, the, three parents who stepped up to be president, vice president, and secretary, and I know I believe there's another position in there, like a parliamentarian that I I wish I could give more shout outs, but thank you for that, and uh, I look forward to the next meeting. Grace was there as a parent, and then I went to show support since I'm the SSD rep, so it was awesome, it was good. Great, thank you. Well, the district really did a great job um, facilitating. I thought that was really amazing. I think Adam did a lot of that, and I don't know who else, but whoever helped facilitate it, it was great. Okay. Adam just pointed at somebody. I don't know who. <laughs> it was all Kim. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody else? No. Now, open period for patron comments. We don't have anybody signed up, so I, I just need an authorization of closed session. Motion enter closed session meeting for the purpose of reading of minutes of previous meetings and corrections and approval of same and other items under the Missouri Revised Statute 610.021, subsections 1 through 21 and 610.022, subsections 1 through 6. Lease, purchase, or sale of real estate, section 610.021-2. Hiring, firing, disciplining, or promoting particular employees. Section 610.0213. Jeff? Yes. Patrick? Yep. Jean? Yes. Grace? Yes. Peggy? Yes. And if I could please get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries.